This really conference happy. will now be recorded. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I always forget that part. Uh, I, it's really good to have everybody on the call today. I, I wish we could see each other. Maybe one day we will, hopefully. Uh, but if you do have a webcam, feel free to turn it on. Uh, I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development in the Division of Library and Information Services. Um, it's great to have y'all here today. What we're doing is talking about COHA, an open source integrated library system. Uh, as you know, I hope uh, these sessions are really for you. Uh, if you decide that you want to go off on another topic, we can certainly do that at some point. Uh, just uh, welcome any ideas that you have. Before we get started, I'd like to just uh, mention a few housekeeping things, uh, the, the ubiquitous uh, housekeeping tips. Uh, we've muted everyone, uh, but once we start the conversation, we'll unmute you, and um, when you're ready to talk, please uh, uh, unmute yourself. If you keep yourself muted, that probably would be helpful in case you're working at home and you have a dog or cat or whatever that the case may be. Um, if you don't have a mic to speak, uh, which uh, we encourage you to do so, but you might want to use the chat. Uh, and it, of course, is available and we'll be monitoring it for your questions or comments. If you get dropped or you're having bandwidth issues, just turn off your webcam until you're ready to speak. And of course, you can speak without the webcam, but we as I said earlier, we'd love to see your face as well as hear your voice. Uh, this session will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel for you for later reference and for those who are unable to join us today. I'm uh, guessing that there's not a single person on this call who's not interested in saving their library money. Using open source software Maybe one way to do this, but libraries are really interested in a quality product that does what it says it's going to do and uh, has solid support at the individual library or library system level. Whatever LMS, ILS, and now it's apparently a library service platform, whatever you want to call it, um, it whatever you use, it should be aligned with your library's priorities and collection management, service, and so on. And I'm guessing that strong vendor or software dis dissatisfaction is usually the reason that you switch to a different system, but I might be completely wrong about that. So I'm hoping that we'll talk about that today too. Uh, for those of you who have not been on these calls before, I typically like to invite um, staff from a few libraries in Florida to talk about the topic of the day because, you know, to me, you'd much rather hear from them, the people who are actually, you know, on the ground experimenting or already have a successful ILS in place. So I am very happy to um, introduce Vicki Brown from Heartland Library Cooperative and Michael Springer from Lake County Library System to talk about using COHA. Please don't hesitate to ask questions or share your experiences as we're you know, talking about this. This is a very informal setting and we just wanna you know, hear from you and hear what you have to say. Uh, so I think I'll start by just asking Vicki and uh, Michael, what what are some of the reasons that you made you decide to try COHA? What what were you using before? Uh, I was not the coordinator at the time this decision was made, so I believe the reasoning was uh, of money savings for the cooperative. Uh, but before we had Koha, we had Polaris. I do know that. And we've only had Koha since October 2018. So not as long as Michael's system. That's okay. That's, that's great to have uh, both um, one with more longevity and one that's more recent. So that's a good, that's a good blend. How about you, Michael? 
Yeah, I'm mostly in the same boat. I wasn't actually on board when the decision was made. We did have um, Symphony beforehand, and I don't think anyone was happy with it at the time. And I think the impetus was really just saving money. Excuse me. So that was, I believe that was why the call was made at the time. Okay. And Robert, I see that you have it in Pasco too, maybe about six years, you said. What's your sort of general, do you know what uh, made y'all switch? Cost, of course. Um, <laughs> back then it was decided by a, a Mr. Sean McGarvey, if you know him. Um, he's all about open source and, you know, trying, trying new stuff and being able to customize and things like that. So I assume that's the reason. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. Um, so I, everybody's kind of shared how long they've been using Koha. Uh, what, how difficult was the implementation part? I mean, I know that, uh, Vicki, I think you said that you were, um, you're still sort of in that implementation phase, um, but others, uh, you know, what was it like to migrate? I was well, here for the migration part as a librarian, and I will say the uh, making sure you go through all of your records beforehand might be a really great idea. Even do inventory, anything that will help clean up all of your records before, I, I think would really have helped us. Um, that would be my big advice to anyone because we're still cleaning up some of our records from the migration. Yeah, we had a similar experience um, when Bywater imported our records over during the initial uh, setup phase. There were a lot of situations where the database migration tools didn't pick up on some of the quirks. Let's call those quirks that we had in our cataloging. Um, they have improved significantly, at least on Bywater's end, because we did recently did another import of a branch library that joined our system, and it was a lot cleaner. So, but yeah, definitely you want to go through your records, make sure there's nothing in there that a computer wouldn't be confused by. Uh-huh. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and let's see, R Robert, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Not really. I wasn't there for the migration. Um, I grew up on Koha, so to speak. I mean, it's probably one of the only library systems I've used. Very briefly used Polaris, um, but that was the only other one. So we've got two people who got, or two systems that got off Polaris. So since we're kind of a closed group here, uh, was there a reason, was it cost primarily that sort of sparked that decision? And and I believe uh, was also mentioned customization, being able to have that control. Yeah, I was under the impression like a um, system like Polaris, somebody like that, right? If you need something changed or done, it's a whole ticketing process, can take a really long time, et cetera, if you're trying to get a feature maybe or something like that. Whereas Koha, you know, um, if you can code, you you can add it basically. Um, so by what we have by water as well, and they're they're very responsive in terms of customer service, or if you need assistance, or if you're willing to pay for a feature, you know things of that nature. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. What what it was like um, working with by water? Yeah, I don't, I don't work with them directly, so to speak, in my department. Uh, we have a librarian that's assigned kind of as the liaison, um, but she always has a great experience with them, definitely. Uh -huh. Yeah, they've been fine, good, good to work with. We haven't had to um, bug them too often with tickets, but yeah, they've been pretty smooth to work with. They don't usually give us any trouble with any problems we have or any requests we have. So. Uh -huh. For us, we don't have someone who codes on staff because we're a smaller system. So we do uh, bother them a little bit with tickets and they have been responsive. And I will say if we ask in our ticket to learn how to do what it is we're asking them to do, instead of just doing it for us, they will provide that information back. So the next time, if it's something small, we can handle it ourselves in-house. So do you have like a blanket agreement with them or do you pay per ticket or how does that work? Um, it is in the cost okay. annually with them. Okay. We have not paid per ticket. Uh-huh. Yeah, we just uh -huh. have a, um, a yearly contract with them, I believe, for a set amount. And if we had any like specific customizations we wanted them to make, I believe they would charge extra for that, but we haven't 
had a need for that. So mm -hmm. just a flat fee yearly. Okay, and I see Sylvia has asked a couple of questions. Um, she says, um, are there discussions for the state library to support those of us who would want to migrate? I don't know specifically what you mean by that, Sylvie. Could you elaborate a little more on that? Are you on, are you on, oh, here you are. Sylvie, do you have a mic? Maybe not. Sorry. Um, yes, I do have a mic. I was just busy trying to type instead of instead of turning it on. Um, sure. Yeah, I know some state have like um, like a state level kind of um, system management um, of their open source um, ILS. And so I was just curious whether the conversation had gone that way at one point. Um, you know, um, so that way there's a contract and a cost sharing across all the libraries in the state for the maintenance. And then there's also like a one stop kind of system management. Okay. And Sylvia, what, what uh, library are you with? Is I'm with one? the Martin County Library System. Okay. Um, typically the uh, state library does not provide that, that type of support that I'm aware of. Um, it would be up to, you could work maybe through your uh, multi-type library cooperative yeah. um, uh, to, to get some sort of discount or um, you know, there are other alternatives I think that you could pursue, but we don't typically provide that kind of support because it's usually up to the individual systems or the individual, uh, well, however that library is governed to make those kinds of decisions. Okay. So, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, and also you had another question, what size team do you have at the library to create your specific code and support it? So you're asking how many people are on a tech team working the, working the back end, huh? Yeah, working the COA you know, customization locally, the training, the staff training, the support. Uh -huh. So does anybody have anything they want to share about that? I think, Michael, are you the the sole, sole person there? Yeah, here in Lake County, I'm pretty much the only one that handles the technical support end of it. And, you know, you don't need, you know, a high-end developer. It's mostly just um, like front front end JavaScript, HTML, that sort of thing. Um, if you do want to do like custom plugins, there is a, a learning curve with those because you do need to know some Perl and how Koha's specific modules work. But for the most part, if you just want to do just run Koha, have some basic customizations, work with Bywater on some more additional customizations, it's really not a, a really deep knowledge of development that you need. Thank you. Vicki, how big is your group? Do you have um, that kind of local support too? I, you're looking at it, and I'm the cooperative coordinator. So I, we're going into this just saying, hey, we have a contract for hosting and support, and that's what I expect them to do. Um, I did a lot of research talking to my neighbors up here in the Panhandle who have had Koha for a lot of years. The Wilderness Coast Cooperatives had it. Panhandle um, Public Library Cooperative System has it. Um, Citrus County has it. Of course, I talked to Sean in Pasco and I've talked to Michael at Lake. And um, so I've talked to a lot of folks. And if you have that capability, that's super. And you can do some cool tweaks, but I'm expecting it to be cool and not needing to do any of that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're doing differently than anybody on this call has done, and I can say that because I, they, Biowater told me that, we are getting Koha and we're also getting their discovery layer, which is called Aspen, at the same time. Uh -huh. So that's the, the pretty graphical layover of Koha, which looks fine on its own, but that's going to give us that appeal that we want. 
And I think we use our catalog as the cooperative's website. So that is a product that allows us to build web pages and have that along with the catalog. Um, so that's answering several needs for us. And Aspen is a little extra per year. You know, you, you're going to pay for that one too. But we are still going to be saving a third of what we were spending annually. So wow. For Sylvie, for your question about you know discounts and things like that, I think the difference in price is so surprising over what you've been paying if you've had Symphony like we do or Polaris, you know, the proprietary nature of software, you're paying a lot for the licensing and you know the knowledge and the exclusivity of what they have. And that's not there in Koha, and that pulls a big chunk out of it. So I'm actually going to pay a third less and have my system hosted in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So now I also don't have to have my local servers anymore. So it's a big savings, plus very flexible and modern in thought. Thank you. Awesome. Vicki B. We don't have one set staff person. I will say that most of the time the staff in the cooperative um, send an issue to Sonia, the assistant coordinator, or myself, and then we'll we'll submit the ticket if we can't fix whatever issue they're talking about. That's how we've been doing it, but most, most things that we can't fix, we just submit the ticket on behalf of the cooperative to Bywater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so, Vicki, Steve, you mentioned about a third savings. Does anyone else want to share how what they're saving? Round, round figures. <laughs> I'm not certain because, like I said, I wasn't actually in charge of anything at the time the transition was made, but I do believe it is about a third of what I've been told they were paying before, and that was, you know, for Symphony, and it was not worth the money they were paying, I was told. So they were very happy with the transition to Koha. It was worth the risk, I would assume. Oh yeah, for the just for the savings and the customization alone. I mean, you have a tremendous amount of control over your Koha installation just by virtue of being web-based. I mean, you can, if you can, like Robert said, if you can code something, you can put it into Koha almost. We have an enormous amount of customizations we put in, like, um. We have a, a faux version of Novelist on our OPAC that you know shows patrons similar books, just automated from the catalog. We have our Facebook feed on the OPAC. We have a, um, a live parallel search with our Overdrive catalog, both on the staff side and the OPAC, that just appears side by side with the physical collection. Just all sorts of things. Anything you can imagine, you can you can add to it. Mm -hmm. So, what kinds of things have you added? Uh, other than what you just mentioned. Sounds like that's the fun part. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, there's, and, and not just the customizations, also just the data you can pull from it. Um, like if you, any kind of reports you can write, if you can write SQL at all, you can pull any kind of broad or narrow statistics you want from Koha, which when I did come in the system at the tail end of Symphony, it seemed like no one knew how to use that. So whether or not Symphony was good at that, I don't know, but Koha lets you run literally just raw SQL to run any report you want. Um, and also being web-based, if there are bugs in the software, like you know, Symphony was a Windows client, you couldn't really touch it. With Koha, there are some bugs you can actually patch with just a little bit of front-end scripting, so there's a little advantage there. But again, just anything you can add, think of, you can probably add to it. Cool. Um, so training, as far as training goes with your staff um, or with colleagues, uh, how has that worked out for you? Uh, when we when we first had the uh, um, Bywater doing the initial setup for us, they did come out and have small seminars with our staff at the time and, and you know demonstrate how certain things work and then they had you know smaller one-on-ones with the branches to help them integrate into it so they, they were very helpful in that and then once 
you know, we got rolling with our technical side, we, you know, we could help our own staff with that. Yeah. So, but yeah, Bywater was very helpful in that regard early on. Well, what questions do you all have for the, these people who are in the know? Did you come onto the call to find out more about what's offered by this particular um, uh, software or what kind of support there was available? Wow, that is the one module I actually have not used to reply to the chat. <laughs> and we're actually, we're, we're exploring it for a couple of our branches, but our county um, locations aren't interested in using it. So that's the one thing we haven't used. Huh. Okay, Jay, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. How's the acquisitions module? We don't use it either in the cooperative, just due to the nature of the different vendors we use and none of the libraries were interested in the acquisitions part, so we don't use it either. So does that mean that there's good interoperability between COA and how, you know, what other vendors you're using? I, we have no idea. I think just due to how many different vendors we use, we didn't, we didn't even explore the option. Um, so I, I really have no information on the acquisitions. Like Michael said, we don't, we don't use it at all. Mm -hmm. We use it. Um, I have very limited knowledge about it, to be honest, because we just switched over not too long ago. Um, from what I hear, it's okay. I mean, I think they had a couple issues with some of the accounting, but through a couple tickets, it got fixed. Mm -hmm. um, if you want more details on the acquisitions, you can always email me and I can direct it to the right person in Pasco for you. Great. Thank you. Can I ask about uh, user notifications for overdues, holds, um, even probably for PR, uh, is there an SMS feature and then an email? And I know with Symphony, we even carrying the old like phone notification also, are the options good and effective? Um, we found them to be effective in Koha with our installation. The default for the SMS notifications is actually SMS by email. So you, do have a bumpy road there with getting the proper carrier information from your patrons in order to effectively send them text messages. But yeah, there's email notifications, text notifications. Um, the email notifications are actually fully customizable HTML pages um, with Koha plugins attached and some amount of scripting as well. So you can customize them as much as you want or as little as you want. Um, they are very flexible. You can send out just digests or one notice for each overdue, for instance, or upcoming due date. Uh, you can customize the, the pre-due notices for how many days you want them to be due. You can have different notices for different patron types. I mean, we found it extremely effective. So Thank um, you. There, there, there is the option to have a real SMS driver. I, I say real, so you can send out just directly to phone numbers, but we haven't actually tried that. We just do the SMS by email. Okay, thank you. And Sylvie, I would say that's another thing that I found attractive when we were looking at Koha is that because I'm paying extra for that service with Cersei, um, paying to have that set up to send SMS notices and also purchasing blocks of, SM of texts. Um, it's not tremendously expensive, but you're still paying for that. And with Koha, they do not charge extra for that. And if you have to have um, SIP protocols for self-checkout or RFID or something like that, um, Bywater uses the API coding and they do that as part of their support and hosting. So that is another way in which I'm, you know, saving annual fees because not only did Cersei charge me to set all those things up, they make they charge me an annual fee just for the fact that I have it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so again, those little savings add up too. Yeah, um, it's sad to say that HTML notices, HTML email is even a big step up, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm curious. I'm actually also from Martin County Library System. Hello. Um, 
I'm curious if there is a a booking module, uh, something to where rather than just a regular hold, you could actually place something on hold for a specific time frame um, for any type of item. So say like I want it for vacation in July, you know, between this date and this date. Is there anything like that in in this? Uh, when you say like um, placing a, like, do you mean like, like checking out an item for a specific date or only having a hold active, like a request for a specific date period? It's kind of putting it on hold, but for a specific date rather than just when it comes in, the hold is available. You could say, I want it on hold on July 6th, and that way it knows not to uh, to make that available for someone. Oh, okay. Yeah, the um, Koha does allow you to suspend holds. The staff or the patron can handle that, and it'll let you suspend it until a certain date. So you could say, like, you know, we place this on hold and then suspend the hold until July 31st, for example. Or, um, the, you know, it will, of course, pass you up in the queue and give it to other people first. So, but yeah, it does allow you to, to suspend holds until a certain date. Okay. I have a question for you guys who have used this for a while. I know that once someone writes the code for anything in Koha and, or Aspen, um, then it becomes part of the shared community. So what are some of the examples of things that you have used that you thought, hey, I would like to have this thing. And then when you go out and look in the community, the code's already there and you could just grab it and add it. Um, we've used some of the reports library from the uh, Koha wiki. It's not updated regularly, um, but there are some uh, snippets of reports, uh, SQL, and some JavaScript and jQuery that you can pull from there, but it's not updated regularly. Some of them are actually from really old versions that they literally will not work anymore in modern Koha. But many of them do still work. Most of the majority still do. So, I mean, there's there's a fair amount of stuff there. You won't be able to get you know, very specific customizations. A lot is just, you know, here's a report that shows you expired borrowers, for example, things like that. So, but um, but any custom code you write for your Koha installation, it's not automatically added to any public repository. It's still, you know, only on your installation at that time until you choose to share it with somebody. So that's, you can just keep it all to yourself if you want. So, it, so uh, but you would update that, content and github is that where all of this is residing um all of actually all of the stuff on the koha wiki is just on their just on the the public koha wiki it's not actually on github or anything there are some uh koha plugins stored on github uh -huh. that you can find i believe through the way yeah there we go the vicky brown just posted it right there um, and a lot of those are really good reports. Some of them, like I said, are pretty outdated. Like um, anything using the accounting system probably won't work because there were significant overhauls to all the tables that handle accounting transactions. But most of them will still work. Um, I know some reports that pull from the Biblio table will no longer work because that table was also overhauled. But most of them will. Uh, Vicki Stever is asking, did any of you use the curbside feature that was developed last summer? Now, that was an example that I had heard of from Renee Roundtree at Washington County that, you know, when curbside began to be a thing, somebody in the Cohawk community wrote the code for that so that you could track your and use kind of like a little internal reservation system kind of thing so you knew what you had and when to take it out to the car and that kind of thing and that that was something that someone saw the need wrote the code put it out there for everybody to use and they had started using it right away so Meanwhile, tested it. Developed one and you could buy it yeah, I was going to say, we saw it, we tested it, and we were like, eh, we'll just let them roll up to the sign and call the number. It's a lot easier and quicker, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the, by the time the plugin had been announced, we had already implemented the system just for our own curbside tracking. Plus, plugins are very touchy in Koha. I would not install any plugin that you are not very familiar with because it's not a robustly controlled system. You can actually just brick your whole installation 
well, I shouldn't say brick because Bywater could recover it, but yeah, like a bad plugin will actually just freeze your entire installation because there's not a lot of control. Jeez. <laughs> so I was going to ask, what's the biggest challenge to using Koha? You just answered that, I think. <laughs> well, I think most people probably don't use plugins at all. It's a, it's probably the touchiest feature of the system, and you have no need for it. I mean, for the most part, Koha will work out of the box. You have no need for plugins at all. So uh, that's not that's not a that's not a bad problem for Koha. Awesome. I know you you kind of answered this earlier, but just to to reiterate, if you have um, a contract and you're looking for a specific feature, it's just basically if you're willing to pay for it, they'll try to make it work on there. Am I correct in saying that? Um, we haven't actually tried, to be honest, but the, as I was made aware of the arrangement, it was pretty much, you know, you can request it and maybe Bywater can develop it for us and add it to the, um, just, you know, add it, add it to the system through, through the Bugzilla. But, but um, for the most part, no, we have never actually done that. So I'm not sure what the arrangement would be. So maybe someone else can speak better to that. We haven't used it either. Uh, we just upgrade when the whole system upgrades for everyone. We have not uh, tried to develop our own of uh, anything. Same. I don't think we've really had a need, or if we did, it was before my time, and uh, I'm not aware. <laughs> but yeah, like 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 Robert, um, I believe said that like you there really usually isn't a big need for it because you can. Most things you would want to develop, you can develop on your end, actually, just with some JavaScript or HTML. It's very customizable, every page, every part of the system. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of why I ask is just we don't really have anyone I'm aware of at the moment that could develop for it. But if it was something we needed, what, did we have an option like that? So how much experience do you think one has to have in order to customize? Experience with coding is what I mean. I wouldn't say that much. Um, there, a, there is an upper limit to how much Koha will allow you to modify things. You, know, you can only get away with so much, and there's only so much you probably should do from the client's perspective. But um, like our overdrive system, for instance, that introduces the parallel searching between physical and overdrive items, just so it's a live search. I mean, that's maybe 30 lines of code. It's not a terribly complex module. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and like simple like client modifications would just be one line of code to fix a piece of, piece of text or add just a, another div to a page, you know, very, very basic stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you have people like Michael that you know if they did it and they have it, then you email them and say, oh, Michael, share your code, and then he does. <laughs> right? Give us your code, yeah. Um, the, 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 there is one catch to, to developing custom code on your end is that like, if you were to take code from another system and implement it on your end, Koha does change somewhat drastically between installations occasionally or between versions i should say so that code may break and you may need to you know reach out and get some more support for it so you definitely want to keep an eye on anything that you bring into your system that you haven't developed on your own yeah i was going to ask about uh, uh uh new versions and how painful that is and how how do they do they uh just make it available and then you negotiate with Bywater or you just do it yourself or how how do you typically upgrade to the next version and how often does that happen um major version yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I don't, I can't recall how often, but in the last two years, we've had like updates happen, I feel like pretty frequently. And for us, these updates happened automatically. They notify you when you log in, oh, an update is coming, make sure you clear your cache on this date. And then the update happens every once in a while, there's a bug that they have to fix. Uh, but for the most part, what we have seen are the updates have been really great and we're happy with what has come out. That's good. 
Yeah, major updates to Koha usually come every six months, I believe. Those are usually the major version numbers. Uh, Bywater generally keeps you about one year behind, like we're on the May 2020 installation right now. Um, minor versions, they'll push out without notifying you, and sometimes that creates some conflicts with certain things, but that's usually not a big deal. Um, but yeah, they're usually seamless. You don't even notice the upgrade happening unless you have a lot of customizations, in which case things will break and reports will change. But aside from that, there's, you usually don't notice. Yes, and the customizations or uh, plugins too can be kind of a hiccup in that process uh, of upgrading, I would assume. What has been an unexpected benefit? Something that you didn't think you were going to have and then you did, or something you thought was going to be extremely painful to do, <laughs> or you know, something like that. What what uh, what what would you say was the biggest is the biggest benefit to you other than the money to using Koa? there were two surprising things I think that I, I mean there's lots of good things that we like but there were two uh, one was during COVID uh, some of our libraries had to go to work from home so having the system work at home was wonderful because they could do everything they would do at the library at home wow. the second thing is small but we really have loved it it's a, a void button and the payment feature so if a staff makes a mistake instead of trying to write memos to finance and fix everything you could just void it and start over again huh. <laughs> very nice and i would reiterate that that the um the ability to work from anywhere pretty much is invaluable especially when we've integrated like the eustace branch recently just the ability to take a laptop or even a phone anywhere and have have your ILS right there available to you to do whatever you want. That's it's been absolutely invaluable compared to a Windows client that's only accessible on your local network. Mm, yeah. So Michael, how many uh, libraries are on your your iteration, your instance of um, Koha? Yeah, we have sixteen at this time. I think. I'm not going to swear to this, but I think Bywater said that we were the largest installation that they were managing, but that may not be the case now. That was many years ago that I heard that rumor. Mm -hmm. And Vicki, you have five, three, seven, 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 Seven. That's nice. That's good. And Vicki, you'll have how many? Six physical libraries and then a lending machine. So seven. Awesome. All right. Anything else y'all want to share about that? Or uh, do you have any, any questions that you want to ask this wonderful group? I do have something that I wanted to share with y'all. It's an article from uh, ALA, American Libraries Magazine, on the Library Systems Report from 2019. Um, there may be a, a more recent version, but it does talk specifically about COA, and I'm sure anything subsequent would. So I will put that link in the chat. And does anyone have anything that they would like to share um, about, you know, things that you've been reading or the, the uh, you know, how did you do your analysis um, before deciding to go with Koha or whatever you're using now? Well, this is Vicki who signed a contract a couple months ago. Um, I think that reaching out to the other libraries in Florida that had Koha and asking them all the questions you want, having um, someone who was willing to give me admin access to their instance of it, 
so that I could look at the back end and actually even go visit them and sit in their library and, and work through and talk through, we got to a point where we knew that COHA was what we wanted, that we didn't want to compare it to proprietary systems for several reasons. I mean, cost is always going to be there, but just the flexibility and the, the, the finding something that fits. But I got a lot of good help from Sean McGarvey, from George Taylor, from Michael, from Eric at Citrus, and in terms of how to write your proposal for purchasing and the things to include. And that was really, really, really nice because you didn't have to start from scratch and writing something up. So if you have determined that COHA is what you want, you want this open source product, and then it's just a question of which vendor is going to host and support it, Mm -hmm. There's a different way to write that up than there is to do the, because then that's a request to bid instead of a request for a proposal where you're going to um, compare all different kinds of ILSs to see if this is really the one that you want. But that, my advice would be, you know, reach out and ask, because if you have an eight page bid document and seven pages of that came from Eric via Sean, who helped him write his, you know, that's, that's a great savings. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. So who, I don't know, if, uh, who on the call is considering uh, looking into Koha to, um, you can, you can just say me <laughs> in the chat, or you can raise your hand. I don't know. Do we have a hand raising feature? I don't think we do on this, but, um, okay. Jay says she is, or he, she, they are. She. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, do you have any other questions for these folks? Well, I do. Um, does anybody know any libraries that have Equinox as their host company? Just out of curiosity, they were not one that could work for us because we were getting Koha and Aspen at the same time, and Equinox doesn't have expertise in Aspen at this point. But it seems like everybody that you talk to has Bywater, and I think Equinox is more of an academic, and they specialize more in, is it Evergreen? The, the direction they went, but I just wondered if I had knew of an Equinox customer. Yes, not. Well, I, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I haven't heard of anyone using that that service now. Sorry, Vicki, I can't help you with that either. Um, well, I was just curious at this point because we've already signed with Bywater and I know that we're going to be happy with them. But um, So one question I have is who would there be an interest in developing like a user group um, that the uh, DLIS can help pull together? for you all, uh, those people who are interested in using or already using uh, Koha. Uh, we want to be sure to support y'all and, and that, you know, it's easy for us to, to provide a place where you can talk um, and share your ideas and so on. I like that idea. This is Jay at St. John's. Thanks, Jay. Well, the idea of having those resources and visiting all of your libraries. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like that sounds great. It'd be something that I'd be happy to take part in if people wanted any you know, any any further questions or 
any future support needs. How often would you all like to try and meet, like quarterly or what What would you like to try? Uh, quarterly would work or every six months even for me right now. Okay. All right. Uh, You know, and I know this is kind of redundant to whatever you you may have access to through uh, COHA. Um, do, is there a user group affiliated with COHA? Or is it just all, you know, sharing um, code and that kind of stuff? I'm not aware of one. There is an IRC channel for COHA. It's funny as that sounds in 2021, but it's mostly for developers as far as I'm aware, but um, I don't think, I, I, I can't think of anything like a user's group currently. Don't they have some sort of a user conference thing? Maybe? <laughs> oh, they did They did have the Kohakon, Kohakon at one point. Oh, oh, I, I only saw it on YouTube though, I didn't actually, I wasn't aware of it being like a live event that people would participate in, but it may well have been. I just saw it on YouTube. <laughs> okay, well, that could be another supplement as well. So why don't we do this? Um, I'll uh, put something together, maybe send out, um, I, I, I do, I think I will have a list of everyone who's logged on today. So if y'all get the word out, uh, then we'll put something together and make it work, you know. Um, uh, I, I want y'all to feel supported. I am not a Koha person, obviously. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but uh, you know, we're more than happy to provide uh, support for y'all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael and Susan for, and Patsy for providing that information. Okay, so why don't I put something together maybe in, let me see, what month is this? May. Maybe try for July. Do you want to try something sooner? For me personally, since we've had this conversation today, I would push that back to like September or maybe just based on then that's more of a quarterly thing. I'm fine with that too, Ms. J. Okay. September-ish. Okay. Meanwhile, y'all get the word out <laughs> and uh, we'll put something in uh, building success just sort of as a tickler. Um, that, you know, what what we talked about and um, what we're thinking about doing in the future and or what we will be doing in the future. Um, and I'll make that work for September. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we're, I'm going to give you all some time back because unless there are any more questions. She's Thank you. Vicki's going live on September 13th. Is that why you wanted to wait until September 10th? <laughs> <laughs> Partially. That's we do okay. have our um, in-person training, too, will be the first week of August. Okay. So then after having some of those experiences, you know, I can give you that fresh experience of how that feels. Sounds wonderful. That sounds great. Okay. Um, Meanwhile, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the recording for today's session will be on the on BLD's YouTube channel. Uh, if you think of other things that you would like to discuss and during the DLIS discussion session, we meet um, every third uh, Monday of the month from three to four. Uh, so if you've got some ideas you want to bat around just send me shoot me an email or 
whatever you want to do, share it with someone else you know who uh, works here at BLV. Um, so our next session will be June the 21st at three o'clock Eastern. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. It was very interesting and I'm looking forward to hearing all about what you're doing in September. Um, until then, I guess people are opening up where we have no more COVID anymore, apparently. Um, and <laughs> we will be uh, um, striving to stay healthy and safe no matter what. So take care, everybody, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.